In our lives, actions, and obligations, moral clarity matters. Given that the essence of moral thought is to address and ameliorate human suffering and to expand human freedoms, how can we afford not to attend to moral clarity when it comes to international relief and development? The Center for Values and International Development seeks to apply the insights, analytical frameworks, knowledge, and experience that already exist within the field of international development ethics to guide relief and development practice. We continue the dialogue with our third of five conversations with today's focus on empowerment as part of the Center's Ethical Development Series, building an effective bridge between the practitioner's community and the ethicist community to the mutual benefit of both and to the significant improvement in the effectiveness of international relief and development. With me is Dr. Christine Coggle and Saji Prelis. Christine is a professor of philosophy at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Her main research and teaching interests are in the broad areas of moral theory, practical ethics, feminism, and development ethics. She is the author of Perspectives on Equality, Constructing a Relational Theory, and she has published 45 journal articles and chapters in edited collections. She's a former president of the Canadian Society for Women in Philosophy, board member of the International Development Ethics Association, and is lead co-editor for the Journal of Global Ethics. Christine is joined by Saji Prelis, who is the co-chair of the Global Coalition on Youth, Peace, and Security, and director of the Children and Youth Programs for Search for Common Ground. Saji has over 20 years experience working with youth movements and youth-focused organizations in conflict and transition environments in over 35 countries throughout the world. In 2010, he co-founded and has been co-chairing the first UN Civil Society Donor Working Group that helps successfully advocate for the historic UN Security Council Resolution 2250 on Youth, Peace, and Security. My name is Evan Papp, and I'm the moderator and producer for the series of ethical discussions for the Center for Values and International Development. Thank you, Christine and Saji, for participating in this discussion. Questions will be addressed to both of you, but this is a conversation, so feel free to address each other's comments. And with that, let's begin. What does empowerment mean? Until relatively recently in most development theory and practice, empowerment meant economic empowerment. As such, it was closely linked to improving a person's productivity, efficiency, and economic status. In other words, empowering people to strengthen a country's overall economic growth. Now a new definition is emerging. Many now think that empowerment should also apply to the need for marginalized, vulnerable, and oppressed people to overcome oppressive norms that limit their freedom and choice. How do you understand the meaning of empowerment? Christine, could we begin with you? Okay, first let me say how pleased I am to be doing this uh, series on empowerment, but also to be doing it with Saji, because we co will come at this from very different perspectives, but they're important perspectives. Each, each of us brings sort of important insights uh, that need to be considered when we're looking at a concept such as empowerment. So I'm going to start a, a little bit back from uh, talking about empowerment as such, uh, to talking about something that I think is important when we're thought, when we're discussing development theory and practice, which is, and these are insights from uh, the capabilities approach, from human development, and that is to think about development less as something that we need to sort of think through with respect to developing countries and more as something that applies everywhere in the world. So development, if we're thinking about development as human development, if we're thinking about development as the capabilities approach thinks of it as removing unfreedoms, then this applies whether you're in a rich country or a poor country. So I wanted to sort of flag that as something that uh, needs to be sort of flagged so that we are not saying, here's what they need to do in developing countries. There's less of a we, them, uh, and that in this kind of understanding of development, than there is when we're sort of pitting what happens in developed countries against what happens in de developing countries. So I wanted to say that to start, because it's going to be empower important, uh, as I see it, for understanding uh, what empowerment can, means, what it has meant, but also where, what it means. And so the next thing I want to do is, is to sort of uh, um, work with 
what the question has to say about empowerment having had a firm kind of understanding of what it's supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be uh, helping uh, countries with economic growth. Um, and and this, this has taken a long road uh, to understanding better uh, uh, why it's not economic growth and why it's not should not be focused on countries as such. And so I, what it, uh, there's a quote that always from Vamarcha Sen that always comes back to me, which is that if you're treating people as the passive recipients of cunning uh, benefits of cunning development programs, then you're you're in the game of okay. So what can we do for this poor country? We'll give them tractors, but the focus is back on what you're going to get out of it, the benefits you will derive from it. I think we've come a long way since then, but we're, the, the, I think there's still a lot of development theory and practice that focuses on uh, sort of giving people jobs, making them economically uh, independent, and this being seed, seen as that's what's going to work to expand their agency, to have them be in control of their lives, and to empower them in the end. And I think those concepts concepts are all related. The idea of expanding agency, the idea of improving well-being, and then how these come together in the notion of empowerment itself. So that's what I would say to um, the question. And I would say that the, the more recent developments, and this is where I'm working, uh, on uh, sort of uh, promoting this idea that empowerment, if it's viewed as something that happens in and amongst people, in relationships, can better enable us to see who's, dis who's disempowered, who, 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 who's uh, uh, not benefiting from so-called development uh, projects and and practices, and so that that, that brings in the, the notion of that that's the very last part of this question, which is that the, I think that the empowerment now is turning to and notions of empowerment is turning to what happens in relationships where some people are more disempowered, do not have agency uh, in the way that other people do, and so it brings in notions of oppression, it brings in notions of oppressive norms. And so I think that that's where uh, a lot of the action is now and should be. And so that's what I would say to that kind of question about, you know, what we mean by empowerment, what has been meant by empowerment, but also where I think it's leading. So thank you. Thank you, Christine and Saji. Uh, thank you, Evan. And again, as Professor Kogels mentioned, it's a pleasure to be with you and this conversation. I appreciate giving me this chance to share this sacred space with you uh, and with a big, you know, Shiro of mine, having her here is a tremendous opportunity, but it's also nerve wracking because I'm not an academic person. So I bring in the practitioner approach. So it may not be academic or theoretical, but I love the conversation. And so we can learn from each other, you know, I, and I can't agree more with the professor's comments that this is not something that we should treat as, a developing country versus developed country. I think that is very archaic concepts that we need to uh, grow out of and unlearn, so that especially, but it is extremely difficult to unlearn these things that are deeply rooted in this concept of a policy panic, a policy panic that has guided us to think that these people in developing countries, oftentimes brown and black, are uh, the obvious where this problem is that we as outsiders have better no notions of how to address them. So it's important to unlearn that. So within this concept of empowerment, I think it's important to recognize that people live really complex lives. And in the growing complexity it has this growing interdependence that people are living in. So when we think about these complexities people live through, the the varying types and scales of barriers that different members of the society also have to pass through to achieve certain goals or their visions is really complex. So finding solutions to the diversity of those people's experiences is challenging, but a necessary thing to do. So the, 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 uh, the other thing that stood out to me was this transactional nature 
that exists within development practice. Uh, and, and we are moving beyond that trans because in transactional has this economic dimension, but it also has this de- creates this dependency. And we have seen from programs on countering violent extremism, for example, millions and millions of dollars have gone in to this transactional relationship of saying, if we give you these opportunities with these jobs or education, then you'll be empowered to make decisions that help you actually not use violence. And we've seen that that actually, that transaction doesn't actually lead to less violence in societies. The idea that the educated population, to be honest, a lot of educated people are the most violent in societies as well. So it's important to understand outsiders or, or you know, role and make sure that we are partnering with, not creating dependencies for, for people to depend on us as outsiders. It's, that's, to me, is the more fundamental message for me that we are happy to unpack this further. Thank you both. Moving on to the next question. Marty Asen's account of empowerment tends to assume the traditional male framing of persons as autonomous and independent. In reality, all people have been formed by parental care, have many social bonds, and have been socialized into the norms and values of a community. What implications would a more feminist framing of an empowered person have? And should we be advocating for such a feminist framing? I would like to start with Christine on this one. Okay, there are many ways in which I found this uh, question to be, in some ways, the most difficult. And because I've always found it difficult to articulate what's going on here that we ought to pay attention to. So I think I'm going to start by by uh, saying um, that there are so many misconceptions and stereotypes about what feminism is and who feminists are that we that I I always like to get clear about what what uh, feminism is and so in doing and reading so much feminist theory I find that there are at least two uh, things common to what all feminist theory is about and one is the recognition that there continue there is and continues to be oppression, discrimination, inequalities, injustices. And the second common feature is these are wrong and we ought to do something about alleviating those that oppression, these injustices, these inequalities, that discrimination. So I think that that unites all feminists, whether they have different accounts of what oppression is, whether they have different accounts of how to alleviate oppression, the, the, that that those are those are the two elements that I take to be common to all feminist theory, and so this gets away from two things. It gets away. Notice that I didn't say women's oppression, women's inequalities, women injustices for women. I I, I think that feminist theories had to learn from other feminists and uh, you know uh, uh, women of color, etc. About what gets missed if you're just talking about women. As, and so I think feminist theory, so the, the one thing I would say here that's going to, going to be important for answering this question is that feminist theory is not only about women. Feminist theory has had to learn, as Saji puts it, uh, the um, uh, uh, f- factors and features and importance of intersectionality. And so oppression, this is now about oppression, and this is now about inequalities and injustices, not only is experienced by women, because women come in all kinds. They can be, it could be a woman of color, it could be a trans woman, it could be uh, sort of a disabled woman, et cetera. So these are all under the realm, in my view, of, uh, and the purview, in my view, of what feminist theory is about. And so that that uh, it, it allows me to sort of talk about what's still missing, even if we, even if not not in feminist theory, but what doesn't get taken into account in much of the mainstream theory on empowerment. And 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 so I wanted to say that, and I also wanted to say that because <clears throat> there are still too many stereotypes of feminists as angry, as anti-male, as anti-family. Etc. And so I, I don't see these as being relevant to what feminist 
feminism and feminist theory is about and feminist movement is about. And so how particular feminists might be is not part of the equation of, okay, what's feminist theory about? What's it doing? What's it? And so I think it's come a long way. And I do think it's more about oppression and oppression of uh, groups more generally, not only women, that feminism is about. Okay, that said, I'm going to take on the particular kind of, uh, uh, and this is the difficult one, part of the question, take on the particular task of uh, what, where I have some disagreements with Amartya Sen's account. Okay, so I think that Amartya Sen um, tends to assume when he's talking about how to enhance agency, how to empower women, he's totally aware of, so, uh, uh, of women's uh, uh, inequalities. Uh, he doesn't talk about oppression, but inequalities, discrimination. He's totally aware of what we that we ought to do something about it. So that that you know that that puts him in in the realm of uh, wanting to change women's lives. Um, but I think it's all for sin when it comes to advocating what will change women's lives. He falls back on work outside the home. Um, become financially independent, economically independent, um, be educated, uh, be literate. And so it's all from the perspective of um, it, it, a kind of liberal framework, if you will, a kind of mainstream liberal framework of this is what's going to empower women. This is what's going to give them agency, enhance their agency. And what I'm saying is not that those things are bad, not that we shouldn't care about women being able to work outside the home, not that that their freedom should be expanded so that they are they are they are economically independent, et cetera, et cetera. Not that those things are bad, but that in advocating that women work outside the home, what it it, it makes what women a lot of women continue to do, and what a lot of women continue to be responsible for doing, it makes that invisible. So. What happens when women work outside the home? And what happens to families? What happens to childcare? What happens to bearing children, rearing children? What happens to housework? Um, so it makes that, uh, it kind of has, it, 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 working outside the home, those kinds of advocating what women do to improve their lives makes what happens in the home both invisible, taken for granted, the third, and the third thing is devalued. Okay, if you want to enhance your agency, get outside the home because that's where the freedom is. That's where that's where you're going to that's where you're going to be empowered. And so, of course, we're not going to say don't let women work outside the home, but we're also going to need to pay attention to, in my view, what gets missed if we are saying that women who work at home are uh, you know have less of a chance of living lives they have reason to value. And Sen is all about, you know, finding out that, you know, it's kind of identifying lives you have reason to value. This isn't the kind of life that Sen is saying you might have reason to value. It's, it's the reason, the life you have reason to value is one of rationality. It's one of markets. It's one of uh, liberal policies of working outside the home, et cetera. But I'm, what I want to say is that it, uh, it's, it, 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 it leaves in place the devaluation of uh, and the invisibility of women's work in so much taken for granted inside the home. And so that's, that's my, uh, and I think that feminists, especially feminists who can, are concerned about uh, so the kinds of oppression, the kinds of injustices that can happen uh, in the home, and what we might mean by labor and what we might mean by um, a, an expansive notion of the agent him or herself, that those are the kinds of things that uh, need to be taken into account if we're thinking about uh, is sort of uh, what stands in the background to uh, an account of agents as and tends to be agents as independent, autonomous, being wanting to live their own lives in particular kinds of ways. And I'm saying we can expand, that tends to be the male independent autonomous agent. I'm saying we can expand an account of who counts as agents, who counts as valued agents, if we unpack the norm that 
even Sen falls into a, a adopting, which is this idea of an autonomous, independent man, if you will, even though he's quite aware. And that, that's the that's the tricky part of this question, even though he's quite aware that women that uh, there's a, a women's agency. A, a, he puts it in terms of that's probably one of the most important areas for development uh, theory and practice is uh, enhancing women's agency. But I, I, I still think that there's something that gets missing um, if you're focused on particular kinds of strategies of working outside the home, uh, becoming financially independent, et cetera. So that's, what, that's how I would answer this particular question. It's a tricky one though. And so it's tricky to, I'm not, I'm not actually advocating women don't work outside the home. It obviously increases their freedom and agency and well-being, obviously, too. But I'm saying, okay, so what else should we be looking at? What's What needs to be uncovered? What needs to be uh, sort of uh, spelled out as problematic with respect to even in the conception of the self here, conception of the self that's not, not this independent, autonomous, uh, market-driven kind of agent? Thank you, Christine and Saji. Yeah, I mean, I, I would never be able to do such an amazing job as Christine did. Uh, saying agreeing to everything that Christine has said, I just want to add a, maybe three additional points here, I think. One is the term feminism itself. And oftentimes men in power struggle with this because they see this as a women's issue. And that's this is where that starts when it comes to seeing women should be at home and all that. So uh, there is a, a lot of work that actually needs to happen with men in power to who actually understand what feminism truly is. And there, uh, Christine described actually the nuances of oppression. I think that's important to keep in mind as th that this is not an issue about women only or men only, but this is a collective issue about oppression. And I think that's a starting point for this. So the term feminism actually is uh, leads to people shutting you off and not listening. So when it comes to these issues, listening as a fundamental principle gets missed because we are not paying attention as men think, oh, there's a women's thing. So that's what. second, you know, I agree but on the ex expanding nature of this account. So why it's important to think of What's wrong? What's, what happens if we monetize women who are staying home, caring for the home, caring for the children? What is the economic value gained from that as well? So that way, a person who might see themselves at home sees themselves as an agent with a little bit more agency than just being a victim as well. If that can be seen in that, I'm not saying that that should be the only way to think about this. Because, but it's another way to expand the definition, expand the conversation about about the various important roles women and men both play in society and in the family and others. The I think the third notion here, you know, within this context of Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement and all, is the Western notions of feminism that actually undermine the natural feminist principles that govern and underpin a lot of the societies and cultures itself. There, sometimes what Westerns, Western notions sees as women who are powerless in, the, in that context might be seen as a lot of power and negotiating room and space. But if you come with the lens of no power and there are, these are people who have, are victims of a system, then you can miss the nuances that are so integral to understand the empowerment way, the, the, the tools and the pathway for empowerment itself to happen from within. So it's really critical to deconstruct that a little bit more. Um, so I just want to share those kinds of reflections, especially based on what I heard. Empowerment must come from marginalized people. It cannot and should not be bestowed upon them by those who hold more power. Instead, marginalized people should pursue empowerment on their own terms. What does this mean for development organizations and practitioners who work to facilitate the empowerment of marginalized and vulnerable groups? What do we do when the funding conflicts with the aims of marginalized people we are seeking to empower? 
Saji, could you please begin? This is such an important question because the primary word for me is funding. Uh, you know, all the other things are valuable, but the key root question word is funding. This is about power then. The recently released vision the USCID had, and uh, now under Samantha Powers, the administrator, lays out a path for U.S. government's development assistance programs and a vision that Shaw talks about investing locally, where local populations have the decision-making authority to shape what it means to them when it comes to their achieving their goals, right? Individual, community, and national development aspirations. While that is such a noble thing, and this is happening within the realm of this decolonizing aid conversation also. But I would argue, while it's a fantastic thing, there are some troubling aspects of this too. And the troubling aspects come primarily because of the word funding. When the U.S. government gives millions of dollars to local civil society now, it gives them the ability to thrive. But it also shuts off the opportunity for them to criticize. So the freedom of expression for young for organizations who are depending on money, especially as within the economic crisis, people need jobs and people want to do things in their communities. It doesn't create the ability for them to criticize, ask questions because of a fear that they might lose their funding source. So I think here is an opportunity to really understand how funding can create dependency and at the same time, how funding can transform relationships. And this transformation aspects need to understand the risks of giving money out as well and have some, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, ways to minimize, uh, to expand opportunities for people to provide feedback, provide criticism, uh, as opposed to shut down criticism. I think this is really important. And this is coming where we are seeing increasing uh, it, the, the challenge to democracy is everywhere now, right? We see leaders coming in with authoritarian mindsets. So, uh, so the, in this context, the U.S. government's giving money to countries is noble and powerful, but at the same time, it comes with tremendous risk that needs to be understood. Second is the barriers that the funding creates for people to access. The more rules there are, the more you create a niche market that, it, that creates barriers for entry for people who are thinking of accessing the money to do things that matter to them. So again, what are the barriers that we are taking down as opposed to putting up when it comes to giving money to developing countries is important. Here is another place where decolonizing aid is an important question to keep in mind. Are we creating barriers for small organizations to access money of 100,000 to 500,000 to a million, right? And have reporting mechanisms that are so cumbersome. But we never ask the same questions from military contractors who are getting billions of dollars and don't have the same types of reporting mechanisms. We don't ask the same questions from corporate execs who are actually getting tax, tax havens when they get money. So who do we trust and who we not trust? Do we trust the white Anglo-Saxon men in power, our business leaders, or security industry people? Or do we trust people of color who are in developing countries who are trying to make their lives better? So these are questions that are difficult to answer but are so fundamental when it comes to money, right? So I, I didn't want to let go of that. I'm speaking honestly about this. It is so critical as development practitioners that we need to understand that. I'll come back after Christian speaks as well. Okay, yes, I, I agree that the important word here is funding, but there's another important word that comes out in what you say, which is accountability. Um, and so who are we accountable to and who and and how does that accountability work? And I think the, the other important thing that kind of came out in your answer is the uh, uh, key role of trust. Who do we trust? 
who do we trust to uh, sort of be the uh, people who receive the money and spend the money, uh, people who give out the money and people who demand a kind of accountability for how that money is being used. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, I don't sure don't have the uh, um, experience you have uh, as a practitioner with these kinds of funding uh, issues, but I, I can speak to uh, about one experience I had uh, when we were working on an empowerment project uh, in around it from about 2005 to 2007 uh, that we got funded to do, which took me to um, Joe Jakarta, Indonesia, to uh, observe, be with, uh, figure out uh, what a local NGO was doing with the concept of empowerment. And this happened in a context in which we are I went with an anthropologist whose work what is in Jakarta, Indonesia. And this uh, work, uh, the timing was such that it almost got canceled because uh, Joe Jakarta had just experienced that fairly hefty earthquake at the time. And uh, we thought, well, we shouldn't be there because they're going to have enough. The NGO is going to have, the local NGO is going to have enough to deal with and in, in, in thinking through um, post-earthquake kind of uh, meeting of needs, et cetera, et cetera. And the director of that particular NGO said, no, this is a perfect time for you to come and learn about empowerment. And, uh, and how, you know, and, and so what struck me at the time uh, as I uh, sort of, uh, uh, as we watched how they were dealing with meeting the needs of those affected by the earthquake was that it was pretty clear that the local NGO knew a lot more about the people and their needs and where the needs were than the large banks that stepped in to throw money at uh, uh, sort of what, what you know, uh, uh, meeting those needs. They put the money where it wasn't needed. They put it in communities that weren't suffering as much. They, they, they even decided what kinds of needs needed to, were, were to be met by providing all kinds of things like uh, tents and uh, without thinking about more basic needs like water, clean water had been threatened, etc. So uh, what occurred to me then was how much, uh, how much local NGOs know that bigger larger uh, NGOs don't know. And the other thing that concerned this director is uh, the World Bank and other big banks stepped in to give money to the central government. And, the, and he was thinking, that's never going to come back to us. The central government is just going to take all that money and it's not coming to us. And so I think that this move to sort of, uh, um, uh, that you described of, uh, of putting, my, you know, putting funding in the hands of the people who or most likely to know what to do with, with that funding is a good move. And I think that the, the accountability might, uh, people might worry that the accountability has to go both ways because there are both good and bad NGOs, as in NGOs that will take that money and not spend it uh, in ways that will empower the people that they are uh, representing. Um, this wasn't the, certainly wasn't the experience of the local NGO I observed and were, and, you know, uh, 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 for um, uh, two months or so, but it, it can be the experience of local NGOs. Um, and so uh, it, uh, tricky questions to do with the funding and to do with the accountability. But I do agree that it can't be the top-down approach of we're giving you this funding, but we also need to know from you uh, how it's being spent. And, we're, and uh, uh, we need detailed, long reports of where the money is being spent. Um, so yeah, tricky questions, but I, I, I certainly appreciate your experience uh, as a practitioner with respect to issues of funding. A uh, lot more uh, experience than I could possibly uh, speak to myself. Agency is a prerequisite for empowerment, but is also inextricably linked with power as individuals are embedded in groups and power structures. What is the relationship between agency, power, and oppression? Should empowerment focus more on increasing individual agency or addressing structural power imbalances? Christine, could you please begin? 
Okay, I would say yes uh, to the last question, which is it should be addressing structural power imbalances. And I think that a lot of what happens in development theory and practices practice focuses too much, certainly in the Western tradition, on individuals and what will give them enhance their agency and uh, and without sort of thinking about the institutions and the structure that impinge on, hinder agency for some, i.e. those who are members of oppressed groups. And so uh, I think there's, there isn't much way around, uh, around the uh, idea of addressing the structural power imbalances. Um, uh, uh, so that's what, how I would answer that question. And you wanted it to be short. So I, I, um, I, and I do think that uh, empowerment, Jay Drydick has done some work on this, so have I, uh, empowerment needs to put power back into what it, the analysis of empowerment. So this power over, and feminists have talked about, all the way back to Amy Allen in the 70s, have talked about the, the kinds of power. The power over, that ha is, the, is what happens uh, with respect to oppression. The power to, the power to uh, do something different with one's life and the power with the collective kinds of actions that are needed in order to empower not only individuals, but groups and especially those groups who, ha who, who are the victims of the power over. So I, I would say that empowerment needs to have these kinds of lessons uh, uh, learned and that it's a lot more than just be giving people jobs or it's a lot more than a then uh, so a fad of microcredit really works and it works everywhere. Uh, so it's uh, uh, that looking at relationships of power and doing something about the structural power imbalances, the institutions and practices that support those relationships of power. Thank you, Christine and Saji. So Christine gave a fantastic framing. So power over, power to, and power with. Let me use that and springboard from that, right? So I fully agree. I think there's a need to think about individuals and structures. Individuals, communities, and structures. So this is connected to that idea of norms, institutions, and markets also. So when you think about this, what are the norms that enable us to address not not attack each other, but address the common problems that we have as a society that sees each other in e see us in each other. Then lies the ability to think of power also, right? Power is not from, I'm better than you. I'm more superior than you. The power truly comes from being vulnerable, as I said earlier. And I think it's important to recognize that. So how do we as a society recognize that? We really don't see that. When we are, our, our backs are up against the wall, from the pandemic, for example, power is being used in the negative way, not the positive way of being the mutual vulnerability. It happens in our relationships. The best relationships we have is when we are vulnerable with each other. That's when we actually have to have transforming, the ability to transform the relationships we have. But we don't have that space in a society. So I think here's an opportunity to think of uh, working on, on, uh, on the norms and institutions in a way that actually enable us to address our common humanity, not, not attack each other. So that's where the power, em empowerment concepts come in matching with the concept of power redefined. This concludes the third of five conversations sponsored by the Center for Values and International Development. In addition to our conversations introducing development ethics and inclusive development, we will also be exploring topics on climate justice and democratic values, all with the goal of strengthening the relationship between development practitioners and ethicists, because moral clarity matters. Mm -hmm.